We're reading in Romans chapter 10 this evening, and welcome to all of you joining us by video and audio tape wherever you are. Drive carefully or sit comfortably. And I'm reading from the uh, authorized version. Wherever you are, you're welcome to Belfast. You're welcome to this Bible study. We're not here to worship any denomination or sect. We're not here to present uh, beauty merely of a building or the particular method of a preacher. We're here to preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And wherever you are and whoever you are, welcome, friend, welcome, our friends. And we're now looking at uh, Romans chapter 10. I'm going to read it all, and I may get through it all, I may not, but we'll have a look at it as the Spirit leads us. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall ascend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, or Jesus is Lord, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. What a verse. What a verse. Think about it. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then... Shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I have found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, and this actually is a very beautiful verse. Just let me put it this way. Have you ever held out your hands for five minutes without anybody holding them up? Just hold out your hands for five minutes and see how painful it is. And the image, my dear friends, is of God standing like this all day without a break. All day. Standing bent with outstretched arms. It's a painful thing. And the image is, of course, of those who don't listen to his call standing back at ease. 
All day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. And as we shall see next week, the title of our message for next week, the 4,000 year day. It is absolutely true that congregations regularly comment on the preacher. A well-known preacher delivered a sermon once before a congregation in which his wife was a worshiper. And when the service was over, he went to his wife and he said, How did I do? And she replied, You did fine. But there was only one problem. You missed several opportunities of sitting down. A little boy went along to hear a preacher who was a long prayered preacher. He prayed very long. But the preacher came to his house for a meal. And the little boy couldn't understand it that the long prayered preacher prayed very short. And little Johnny said to the preacher, Sir, he says, You don't pray so long when you're hungry, do you? <laughs> some little eyes and some little hands and some little brains and feet are walking and working around. They're watching and listening. And they have every right to comment on the preacher. And you have every right to comment upon me and give your view of me. But then I also have a right. I also have a right uh, to talk about you. I also have a right to be able to mull over the congregations I preach to as to what kind of congregations they are and their level of interest or whatever. And it might interest you to know that a lot of preachers discuss their congregations after it's all over with God. And here's one of them. Here is a dynamic, brilliant academic taught by a brilliant chameleon, converted through a dramatic experience on the Damascus Road, traveling all over Europe and the Roman Empire, preaching Christ. Some of his congregations beat him up and left him half dead. Sometimes I wonder if it wouldn't do me good. That our preaching is so weak and pathetic, it draws no response. So powerful were his words, they hated the sight of him. And they tried to beat his head in. But he was some preacher. I am told by an expert in Greek that the word in the New Testament for Paul teaching in the house of Tyrannius is that he taught them, if I remember right, every day from 10 o'clock in the morning until 3 o'clock in the afternoon without stopping. When he arrived at one church, he had little time to spare and so preached right through the night and preached so long that perhaps the flickering lights of the oil lamps really got to a fellow sitting up there by the window and he fell off the window and was killed. Amazing, isn't it? Here was a man who, when he arrived in a town, caused riots. What does our preaching cause? Hmm? When that little dawn 
from Oxford, was it, was filled with zeal for God when he got saved and his heart was strangely warmed through a, a commentary of Luther's on Romans being read in public. His heart was strangely warmed. He was converted through a commentary of Luther's on Romans being read in a public church meeting. When Wesley went out, they stoned him. I've read some of his journals, what they gave that man. But he saved England from the French Revolution. And I am absolutely convinced that we need in Northern Ireland another movement of the Spirit of God. For we've got into hard legalism that is choking the death, the, the very life out of the church. And we need a fresh movement of God. Will you be at the forefront of it? Will I? Look at this man. Look at his heart bared for a wee second or two. He describes how he feels. My heart's desire and prayer for Israel is, he was preaching to Jews all over the Roman Empire, my heart's desire for them is that they should have big houses or small houses or plenty of money or not very much money or they should give up their slaves or they should get more slaves or that the Roman Senate should have more senators in it and they should do something about the roads in the empire. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And I can tell you, folks, this man was sincere. And although they beat him up constantly, in fact, the Corinthian church was a, which was, was a very proud church, highly gifted. They said that Paul's physical presence as a preacher was weak. No wonder. God help them, the snobs. They even criticized his manner of speaking. They said his manner of speaking was contemptible, didn't suit them. We man beaten and kicked and thumped and shipwrecked and in fear of robbers day and night and the care of all the churches. Is it any wonder when he ever stood before them he didn't look a very fit man? Oh, the power of the life of Paul. Was there ever a servant of Christ quite like him? See the burning heart. I want to see my own folks saved. He wasn't scared of that word. Oh, I've quoted it before, but I think it's very powerful. What do you want? What do you want for your folks? What I want for mine. What do you want for Ulster? What do you want for Ireland as a whole? What do you want for them? That we just merely have peace? And no more public trouble? Word that we had it. And may God send it to us. But even if we had peace and no more terrorism, would that solve all the problems? Would we all be happy then? Surely it's far deeper than that. Surely your prayer and my prayer for this land 
would be that our brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and friends and cousins and neighbors and workmates and teachers and doctors and nurses or wherever they are, that they might be saved. Oh, says the poem. It's one of my favorites. Listen carefully. I've finished six pillows in needlepoint and I'm reading Jane Austen and Kant and I'm up to the pork with black beans in advanced Chinese cooking I don't have to struggle to find myself for I already know what I want I want to be healthy and wise and extremely good looking. I'm learning new glazes in pottery class and I'm playing new chords in guitar and in yoga I'm starting to master the lotus position. I don't have to ponder priorities for I already know what they are. To be good looking, healthy and wise and adored in addition. Oh, I'm improving my serve with a tennis pro and I'm practicing verb forms in Greek and in primal scream therapy all my frustrations are vented and I don't have to ask what I'm searching for since I already know what I want to be good looking, healthy and wise and adored and contented. Oh, I've bloomed in organic gardening and in dance I have tightened my thighs and in consciousness raising there's no one around who can top me. And I'm working all day and I'm working all night to be good looking, healthy and wise and adored and contented and brave and well read and a marvellous hostess and bilingual and athletic and artistic and won't someone please stop me you that lady you that man in another form my heart's desire and prayer to God for my people is that they be good looking, healthy and wise. No. My heart's desire and prayer to God for my people is that they might be saved. And don't think you're talking to a fanatic for Paul was not a fanatic. He was one of the most brilliant men of his day and he counted all his learning compared with learning to know Christ as being like rubbish in comparison. He assigns a reason then, you see, as he begins to say, these are the people I'm preaching to and there's something awful wrong. I want to see them saved, but they're not getting saved. And why are they not getting saved? I'm discussing my congregations all over the Roman Empire. Why? If my burning desire is to see them one for the Lord, that they come to know Jesus Christ. Friend, have you any idea of the riches there are in Christ? Have you any notion? Have you any idea of what it means to know him? in the midst of all the mess of Western society. Have you any idea what it is to have your sins forgiven and to know Christ as your Savior? Why a man burdened down with pain this day said to me in the prayer meeting tonight, he says, I've had a lot of pain today, but he says, I've a lot of problems, but praise the Lord, it's good to be saved. 
He's becoming a rare specimen when he says that. Because I think sometimes even those who have this experience of salvation have lost the joy of it. And Paul is absolutely bursting to show them what it is like to know Christ. But they're not getting converted. I have a, a slight idea of what it's like for I sat one morning in a synagogue in Leeds. A man was assigned to me to explain what was going on. And I sat amongst them for two hours with my mouth open, absolutely thrilled at the way they, you know, were, some of them were worshipping. The singing, the turning to Jerusalem, the kissing of the laws that was carried round. It was very moving. And I felt like jumping up in that synagogue in Leeds and say, Ye men of Israel, why do you stop? Can you not see it's all pointing to the Messiah himself? Only, I didn't want to be put in prison in Leeds. I didn't want to hurt the wee man who was sitting beside me who was so kind. Or the other dear brother who had brought me in and furtively looked up and down the road before he beat it through the door with me. Almost, not quite, but. Hadn't the courage that Paul had to sit in the synagogue and say, why do you stop here? Can you not see there is more? It's all speaking of one that is to come and he has come. And he did it. And they threw him in prison. And they maligned him. And they beat him up. And so on and so forth. But he kept on coming back. And he kept on coming back. And when they threw the bricks at him and all the rest of it, he kept on coming back. And preached Christ to them. But many of them were not getting saved. And he now analyzes why. And I preach to a whole lot of you at nights. And I wonder why some of you don't get saved. And I wonder why some of you go away home without Christ. And it's not the first one has come to this Bible class and turned away from it into a life of sin. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about. Who are far from this place tonight. He says, I note about them, I note about them, he says, that, that they have a zeal for God, but the reason assigned to the fact that they are not Christians and not getting saved is they have a zeal for God. I can see that, but it's not according to knowledge. Verse 2. They have a zeal for God. Well, how couldn't they? Who was thinking about this? Do you ever stand at night and look at the stars? I do sometimes. And some nights I stand and look at the stars and pray, and I often tell about the night I did it, and my neighbor thought I was drunk. And I'm standing there, I come home from a meeting, and I'm standing in the garden looking up, and I'm praying and worshipping, and I didn't know there was this quiet figure standing across the road in the dark, dark darkness watching me out for a wee late night walk. And I could almost hear him saying, what has got into that preacher? He's muttering to himself and looking at the stars, that preacher's drunk. Well, he didn't quite say that, but by the way he said to me, uh, by the way he said to me, look at you. I knew that's what he meant. <laughs> I said, yes, it's me. He says, that's good. I just wondered if it really was you. I said, yes, well, it's me. And I beat it through the door. It's really me. I can't help it. Why? Because it'd be very hard not to have a zeal for God, wouldn't it, in one sense. See, everything you see up there is a galaxy, not a chocolate bar, a vast concourse of stars, one galaxy. 
But astronomers are now convinced that there are 20 galaxies like the one you can see within two and a half million light years and that there may be a billion galaxies within even photographic range of the 200 inch Mount Palomar telescope. A billion galaxies like the one you see out there now. A billion of them. Now just think about this for a wee moment. If you travelled at the speed of light that's 300,000 kilometers a second a second if you traveled at the speed of light you would arrive at the moon in one and one-third seconds take you one and one-third seconds to get from here to the moon at the speed of light how long do you think it would take you traveling at the speed of light to get to the nearest star Four years. At 300,000 kilometers a second. And you travel at that speed for four years until you arrive at the nearest star. That's only a star. Oh, they have a zeal for God. Mm. They worship the God who made the stars and the world. And a whole lot of you are the same, maybe, even watching or listening. You have a zeal for God, and I commend you for it. You say, yes, there is a God. Yes, I believe there is a God. I believe there's a God in charge of the universe. There's got to be. I believe it. I see it all around me. And Israel had not only seen his works, they had experienced his mighty acts. But what did they then do? Well, says Paul, being ignorant in verse 3 of God's righteousness, they went about trying to establish their own. And they wouldn't submit to the righteousness of God. Verse 3. For, says Paul in verse 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. The reason assigned in verse 2, the error indicated in verse 3, and the truth stated in verse 4. They have a zeal. That's the reason assigned why they're not saved for God, but it's without knowledge. The error indicated is that they are trying to establish their own righteousness. What does that mean? Well, can I put it in plain, simple terms? They were enthusiastic for God. They, they wanted to worship God and did worship God, but worshipped Him in the ignorance of this fact that they thought you had to work your way to heaven. They were trying to establish their own righteousness. They would do a whole lot of good things to try and please God, and if God saw all their good points, then he'd mark them all up, and if they outweighed their bad points, then they'd be God's friends, and then they'd get into God's heaven by being good. But, says Paul, here's the truth stated in verse 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You say, I don't understand what that means. All right, let me tell you. Let's say that you go home tonight. God forbid it should happen. But you get a thermometer, stick it in your mouth, and it's 105. And your mother says, those meetings do things to you down there. And you say, no, it's not the meetings, Mum. I'm sick. It's 105 or 120 or whatever it can go to. You'd be boiling by then. And the thermometer tells you there's something wrong. So I happen to call for supper after the meeting or whatever, and uh, 
I say, you're looking awful. You say, yes, I've, you see, it's thermometer here. It, it tells me that my temperature is very high. I say, right, I know a very good doctor. And I go get a friend of mine, maybe who's a doctor, and bring him along, a learned doctor, and in he comes. And here you are, still sitting, sucking the thermometer. And the doctor says, now look, what I want to do is give you this medicine, and it'll bring your temperature down, and you'll be okay, right? Okay, so we go off to a late-night chemist, and we get it, and we bring it along, and we... Uh, set the medicine and come into the room and set it down. You're still sucking the thermometer. And then I come back a week later and, and, and you, 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 the steam's almost coming out of your ears. You're still sucking the thermometer. And you say, have you taken leave of your senses? I would say to you, rather, have you gone barmy? Well, well, this temperature told me I was sick. So this is the thing that can keep my temperature down. You say, don't be daft. That thermometer is only given to you to show you that you're sick and to drive you to the doctor so as the doctor can make you better. Take his medicine. And all around Belfast and all around the world, they laugh at people like me who preach that should you go to church every Sunday and should you give all your money to the poor and should you never swear and never this, that or the other and you pile up all of these good works, it won't do that to save you. You say, but, but surely it's psychological even. Human psychology would tell you that, that it is behavior that will please God. Ah, but my friend, God's thermometer is the law. And the more you try to keep God's law, the sicker you see you are spiritually. You can't love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor is yourself. And you try and you say, I'm trying awful hard, and it is very difficult. And I'm trying to keep God's law. It's awful hard. Of course it's hard. Because God's law is given to you to show that you are desperately sick, spiritually speaking, and then to drive you to the one who can cure you. And who is he? The end of the law, says verse 4, is Christ. And he is the one who will make you right with God and bring you to the Savior. Now, I'm not trying to get at anybody here. This is a true story, and it happened to me. I was in the south of Ireland once, and I was selling some copies of a very famous translation of the Bible called the Monsignor Knox translation of the Bible. It's a very famous translation. And I was selling it around this place, and suddenly I went up this, through this door, or through this gate, and up this avenue, rang the doorbell, opened the door, and I noticed the local priest's hat hanging in the hallway. Didn't know it was the priest's house. If I had, well, maybe I wouldn't have knocked it so hard that he might have chased me out of the place for selling Bibles around his parish. But the wee maid came to the door. Where in the heart of County Galway somewhere, I think it was, or County Clare. And I thought, oh dear, I wonder what the parish priest will say about me, a northerner standing here selling Bibles in his parish. And I wondered, should I beat it or stay on? She says, just, just wait there. I'll get, get the father for you. I said, okay. And when he came out, I was still there. He says, come on in. Come on in. I says, I'm selling Bibles. We're in the park. Come on in. So I says, okay. I think he said, shut the door. There's more. But <laughs> he sat me down. And I can see him yet. He was a very genial man. He got his pipe out. And he started to smoke his pipe. And as he was smoking his pipe and he put his feet up, he says, well, now tell me, he says, what do you think of Ian Paisley? <laughs> well, after we got over that question, <laughs> uh, 
which was very interesting. You know, I met Ian Paisley the other day in a restaurant, and he said to me, that was a very good job you made of the book of Joseph that you wrote about. I said, well, thank you very much, brother. That's very kind of you. It's a very good job you did, he says. Uh, he says, I've read a very good book, he says, uh, calling over one of his friends. He says, Sam, you, you go get him one of those books, he says. I would like Derek to have it, he said. It's a very, very good book on Joseph by Lawson. He said, have you ever read Lawson? I said, no. He says, you know, Derek, when you read Lawson, you'll be sorry you ever wrote a book on Joseph. <laughs> Well, <laughs> that was quite an experience. So I'm looking forward to reading Lawson. But it was kind of him to say a kind thing about my little book. But, you know, after we discussed the inn for a while in Northern Ireland and so on, the priest suddenly turned to me and he said, well, what is the essential difference between you and me? I said, well... I said, I believe in eternal security, and you don't. I said, notice what this Monsignor Knox translation says. It says, I give unto my sheep eternal life, and they shall never perish. Not to all eternity. And he looked at it, and he looked at it, and he looked at it. He says, he says I, I'm not a Bible scholar, you know. He says, I, I'm not really a preacher. He says, I'm just a pastor. But I said, that's what it says. You don't believe that if I get saved, I can not, and if I die as I am in Christ, all will be well and that my sins are forgiven. You believe that I could fall out of a state of grace and I could perish. I can never know I'm saved. And you know, we had a very interesting discussion. And then off he went and he got another translation out. And it was fascinating because we were really talking heart to heart now, compassionately and kindly together about the things of God. And that dear man opened that book and he said, look, read what that says. And it said in that translation, I give unto my sheep eternal life and they shall never perish so long as they cooperate with me. Now, there may be many dear Roman Catholic friends here this evening and I am not here to mock you or to arrogantly speak to you. But I want to tell you that there are loads of people who call themselves Protestants and neither do they believe, as many of you believe, they don't believe either that you can know you're saved and be sure of it. Millions of people in churches, both so-called Protestant ones and Catholic ones, do not teach that it's possible for anybody to know that they are saved and that their title is clear, as the old preachers put it, to mansions in the sky. They don't believe it. They think it's presumptuous. It's pride. It's, 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 it's wrong for any mortal to say, I'm saved, and I know it. They say that's cheeky. It's arrogant. How can anybody do that? Sinners that we are. If you cooperate with God, you'll be saved, as long as you cooperate with God. But my friend, I beg to differ. Because the scriptures are very clear on the matter. Absolutely clear on the matter. That as far as the word of God is concerned, you can know now that your sins are forgiven and know now that you're going to heaven. And know now Christ is your saviour. And you need of no fear whatsoever. Of death or Satan and his power. You say, mister, is that possible? Yes, it's possible. Why? 
because all of this teaching, wherever it comes from, that says you can't know, is going back to exactly where Israel were at the beginning of this chapter, as Paul is saying, they are trying to establish their own righteousness. And you can't establish your own righteousness. Why? Because Christ is the end of the law. The law cannot save you even if you try to keep it. It's to everyone that, verse 4, believeth. Oh, says Cowper in his lovely poem on your note sheet, how unlike the complex works of man, heaven's easy, artless, unencumbered plan. No meretricious graces to beguile, no clustering ornaments to clog the pile. From ostentation as from weakness free, it stands like the circlian arch we see, majestic in its own simplicity. Inscribed above the portal from afar, conspicuous as the brightness of a star, legible only by the light they give, stand the soul-quickening words. Believe and live. And it does not depend on the fact that you cooperate with God. It did under the law, but the law is not an end. Well, this is fantastic. That's what the law says, you cooperate with God. But that's not what faith says. Now, what are the practical points? We've got to get the practical points from these first four verses very quickly. Number one, sincerity should mark your life. Have you got that? You're not saved by sincerity, but you may certainly be lost through insincerity. He that is sincere is sincere in all places and at all times. Sincerity is the queen of virtues. Christian, be sincere. In public, in private, wherever you are, with whoever you are, on your own or otherwise, be sincere. Sincerity counts. Paul was sincere. My heart's desire for them is that they might be saved. Second practical point coming very clearly is that spiritual zeal should be tempered with Bible knowledge. It's possible to be sincere and think you can work your way to heaven and try to work your way to heaven and refuse to go home by the way of the cross and trust in Christ alone for salvation and depend on your own good works and perish and sincere all the way. Zeal for God must be tempered with knowledge. Millions are still clinging to that thermometer to make them better. And it won't but it'll point them to the one who can, the great physician. Thirdly, mere intellectual knowledge of God's Word without an appreciation of its spiritual meaning is a very sad thing. Here are these millions of people who have a knowledge of God's Word, says Paul, they have a knowledge of God's Word, an intellectual knowledge of God's Word, but they don't understand the spiritual meaning in it. And there are a lot of people around like that. They can see no spiritual meaning in Scripture whatsoever, and they're blind to all the wealth that's in Christ. And I want to tell you something, folks. There are even some folk who profess Christ, and they can't see much in the Word either. And they're not here. And they've no desire to be here. And they're supping at the world's votaries. And what I want to know is if they can't take the Word of God now, and they're supposed to know the Lord, how on earth do they think they're going to spend all eternity? Do you realize that the Bible says there will be some Christians who will get into heaven and they will get in trusting in Christ alone for salvation, yes, but they'll get in just by the skin of their teeth? Saved so as by fire, like Lot was. The very city was burnt around him and he escaped, but he, he had no blessing and he certainly didn't have what I'm going to read to you now. Have you ever noticed this? God really spoke to me about this. This is a wee word from the Lord now. So take it from the Lord. 
First Peter for a moment. And I'm taking my time over these verses. I'm only officially down to verse number 13 for tonight anyway. Second Peter 1. Now I want you to think about this. Intellectual knowledge of God's Word without an appreciation of its spiritual meaning. And we blame the unconverted for not seeing Christ in the Word. And what happens here? 1 Peter 1 and verse number 10. Wherefore, the rather brethren, 2 Peter, sorry, 2 Peter 1 and 10. 2 Peter 1 and 10. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Make sure you're saved, he said. Well, you saved at all. Are you sure you're saved, he said? You profess to know Christ, some of you. Do you really know him? Make sure that you do. Why? For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Some Christians are going to have an abundant entrance into heaven. And some aren't. You say, is that true? Well, look. Look at verse number five. You're saved, right, in the earlier verses, but verse five, the saved person. Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. You've had faith in Christ as your personal Savior. That's very good. Now add knowledge to it. And there are a whole lot of Christians. If I were to expound Romans to them and say, ah, oh, well, you know, it's just, you know, I'm saved on my way to heaven, brother. It's a simple faith. I'm saved. I don't need all those things. You know, I'm all right. I'm saved now. It's all right. It's too complicated. And they think that's great and wonderful and holy. It's anything but it. It's pathetic. You are commanded by the Word of God to add to your faith knowledge. And the more knowledge you add of the things of God, my friend, you'll take it with you. Did not Mary choose that good part, said Christ, which shall not be taken away from her? Martha was too busy to sit at Christ's feet and learn from his word. She didn't get it, but Mary did, and it wasn't taken away from her. So there is an abundant entrance. Pilgrim has this, of course, in his Pilgrim's Progress about the abundant entrance given to Christian. You say, I never thought of that before. Well, think of it now, folks, because there it is before you. And when you've added knowledge to your Christian faith, then add virtue. Virtue, sorry, knowledge, and then add temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And why on earth are our church services so barren? I'll tell you why. Do you know why people will pay somebody to preach to them? And let him be the expert rather than dig in the word themselves? Do you know why people will give to missions day and night and never think of going themselves? Because if they went, they wouldn't have anything to tell the people. And if they were called upon to even touch on the beginning of these wonderful chapters, they wouldn't have a clue about them. Why? Because the Scriptures are very clear. They're barren and unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's implied that there are believers are barren and unfruitful in their knowledge of Christ. And they're as dead as dodo. And there's no worship in them. And they can't feed the people of God. Most of them are asleep anyway. They've been up so late on Saturday nights. And they come to the Lord's table and doze through it. And it would never dawn on some of the young men or even older ones sometimes, that if they had spent a little while on Saturday night on their knees around the words, that God could have given them something for the people of God of a Sunday morning. But when they come, they haven't got anything. Why? Because they're barren and unfruitful. I'm saved, so I'll make money. 
and I'll fly about on Saturday nights and this and that and the other, and I'll not bother, and I'll let the, let the experts do it. What do you think the Word of God is teaching? When it says when you come together, one has a psalm and one has a hymn and one has a spiritual song and so on. If you're going to exercise that kind of thing, you have to be exercised before God about it. And if you're going to be fruitful for the Lord, young Christian, and that's what's so wonderful about many of you, that you are prepared to give hours to the study of the Word, then you just don't have a mere intellectual knowledge of the way of salvation, and you've trusted Christ and so on. You begin to see the spiritual meaning in it. Why was it that in a former generation, even ignorant men coming home from the mines, and I knew some of them, some of the greatest Bible teachers I've ever listened to. And there aren't their pairs about today. Their peers are not about. And they came home coming out of the pit or whatever in Scotland and other places. And sometimes they got into the old bath and scrubbed themselves in the kitchen. And they didn't even have running water. And gave themselves to the word of God. And when the saints gathered, they got up. And they had a, a very word from heaven from, for the people. And they had no university degrees. Many of them were self-taught. And many of the older women, I can remember some of them, on a night you would find them uh, sitting outside reading the Bible and getting something from God out of it. A generation that had something. And now we're so sophisticated and computerized and we're this and we're that and the other. We're paying the experts, we think, to tell us and teach us. And we're not studying the Word for ourselves. That's the challenge I put out in this tape to the whole Christian church and to your heart and to mine. Add to your faith knowledge so that you'll not be barren and unfruitful. And that's why it's so thrilling to see you here and keep at it. But he that lacketh these things, verse 9, is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. They forget the rock that the Lord hewed them from. They forget what the Lord has done for them and they can't even see afar off the Lord's coming and things in the Word. All they're thinking about is grumbling and moaning and this and that and the other about the immediate situation. See what happens. It eats the church alive. And it's eating the Christian church and Ulster alive in many places and across the world. They're blind. And these are Christians. They can't even see the lovely things regarding Christ and his word. And they've forgotten that their sins were forgiven. Wherefore, you make sure that you're the Lord's, he's saying in verse 10, so that an abundant entrance may be ministered unto you into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, don't let that word take away from you your assurance of salvation. Don't be silly. Even a little child who has trusted in Christ for salvation alone will be saved. But if you want an abundant entrance, if you, want to, if you want to administer the coming kingdom, if you want ten cities to rule over, you'll not get it by twiddling your thumbs and watching TV and reading novels and going to parties and fiddling around with your life. I'm telling you, you'll not get it raking about. It'll cost you something with the book and alone with God. And I challenge you, young men, up unto it. Whole land lies in front of you. There are dozens of you could be out there over the land preaching the gospel at the moment. You could take halls and barns and churches and in the open air and get out there and preach Christ and thousands could be converted in a few months' time if you'd bestir yourself. There's the challenge to take Ireland for Christ in these days, north, south, east and west. He that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off. He has no vision. Or she either. So there's the challenge. And I think it's powerful. It's very practical. Mere intellectual knowledge with an appreciation of spiritual value. Now back to Romans 10. That's really where Israel were, and that's even sometimes where Christians can get to. A false idea of righteousness is a disaster. Let's not be smug in evangelical truth that we believe. Fifthly, the secret of blessing and power is submission to the heart of God and acceptance of His will. And here now we have, if, if on the one hand, the righteousness that they establish for themselves is no use, 
Now Paul moves into the most exquisite terms ever set, and he says, here is how righteousness is established before God that is real, not by man's works. And here are God's terms, and they're very beautiful. Here is righteousness by faith described from verse 6 to verse 8 in particular. Now let's go back to the context. These people weren't drunks, were they? No. They went to the synagogue, didn't they? Yes. They went to family festivals, didn't they? Yes. Yet they weren't saved. No. Was it that they were doomed to stumble? No. It was, let's remind ourselves that they are saying the best way to get saved is to work your way to heaven. Now Paul opens up. He says, don't you stand there, he says, and say to me, you know, Paul, you're telling us that Christ is the end of the law, and if we simply believe in him for salvation and his finished work, we'll be saved. Now, Paul, if we had Christ, you know, if you would bring him to us one of these days alive and have him sitting in the dining room or bring him down to the synagogue and we could hear him, then we might believe. If you could bring Christ down from heaven, then, you know, we'd believe. If only Christ were here. You remember the woman at the well? She dodged every way to get out of Christ's questions. And then suddenly she turned to the Lord when the Lord told her about her sin and so on. She said, well, <laughs> of course, she says, you know, when the Messiah comes, he, he'll tell us everything. And Jesus said, I that speak unto you am he. Ooh. She was looking into his eyes. And maybe you stand in some cathedral someday where a person believes in a lot of sacraments and so on and don't believe in getting saved. Although there are plenty of folk in cathedrals who do believe in getting saved. But let's say there's somebody there and they say, look, it's merely coming to this beautiful building and worshipping, you see. And, and you say, I need to be born again. Well, that's, that's fascinating. But uh, oh, when the Lord comes, sure, he'll, he'll tell us who's right. Or maybe somebody in some little place somewhere, and it's not a cathedral at all, somebody working away in some social corner somewhere, and they say, ah, oh, you say you've got to be born again. I don't believe in that. When, when the Lord comes back, sure, he'll sort us all out. Paul says he has come, and he has spoken. And you don't need to go into heaven to bring Christ down. And you don't need to go down into the grave if some of them say, I don't believe in his resurrection, to bring him up again and say, well, now, if you brought him out of the dead, we think he's dead, but if you brought him back from the grave and he were standing here, then we'd believe in him. No, Jesus has already covered that one. Even if the very people out of hell were to come back, men who are in, and women who are in hell now were to come back and testify, there would be people maybe pack out some hall in Ulster and, and listen to them and they go home and say, well, oh, it's very, very good, but uh, so what? I'm going home to my telly and beans and chips. I'm telling you. So what? That doesn't solve the problem, bringing Christ down physically or bringing someone or him back from the dead. No, says Paul, what I want to tell you folks is the word is nigh you and even in your mouth and in your heart. It's right here. It's so close. Just as the word was accessible in Moses' day, the Lord is accessible to you now. He has come down from heaven. That's the incarnation. And he has come out of the abyss. That's the resurrection. And he is accessible. You must believe on him in your heart and confess him as Lord with your mouth. And God doesn't ask merely for an intellectual assent to the dogma. He asks you for a personal commitment to him as Lord. And what did they do? If you shall confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And if any of you dare and say to me, says Paul, that some will say, well, some are religious and some aren't religious. And if you're religious, well, if that gets you through the night, like Frank Sinatra said about religion, if that gets you through the night, well, that's all right. There are other things that get me through the night. 
And if that's what you want, that's all right. No, says Paul, you can't say that some are naturally religious and some aren't naturally religious. There's no difference. We're all the same. We all need God. We all need to be saved. Neither Jew nor Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The scope of it, whosoever. The simplicity of it shall call upon the name of the Lord. The substance of it shall be saved. Anybody can call. Young or old, rich or poor, cultured or crude, young or old, or bond or free, or Jew or Gentile, but Israel are not saved. No. Why are they not saved? Because they refused to buy to God's exquisite terms. Are you going to do the same? Shall we pray? Father, thank you for your mighty word. We pray that you will use it tonight to speak to all of our hearts and stir us. We thank you that righteousness by faith can be realized and assured. And the universality of the gospel goes out to all tonight. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, we pray that someone in this great congregation will do that just now. And they may call upon him, and in calling upon him, come to know him as Savior. Father, thank you for the power and challenge of your word. And the people of God said,